All right. Well, hello and welcome to the Financial Blogger Podcast. My name is Philip Taylor. I write at ptmoney.com. Also, I'm the founder of the Financial Blogger Conference. That's at uh, fincon13.com. And today I have the privilege of talking with Mr. Stacy Johnson, uh, who is the founder and chief editor in chief of uh, moneytalksnews.com. And uh, Money Talks News and Stacy have been around uh, a while doing, doing his thing. And he now he's syndicated across several TV stations with the videos he does or uh, in terms of text is also syndicated across several publications so he's someone who's been doing this a while and um, I'm anxious to talk to him because in you know in terms of my personal blogging I want to start moving toward a similar model um, and so I'm excited to ask him some questions and uh, let you guys learn about him and how he does what he does so Stacy welcome to the podcast thanks for having me Phil I'm honored so for those who may not know about you, tell us a little about you and your background. Well, I started off, uh, I've been a CPA since 1981, I guess, and I, was, uh, I did that for a few years, got narcolepsy, left the accounting business, and I uh, was a stockbroker for 10 years after that. And then I guess I started in TV news in about 1987 and have been doing uh, doing that as my living since uh, 1991. So I've been on TV, been on TV altogether about 25 years or so and, and making a living at it for 22. Just started blogging uh, basically three years ago, 2010. Oh, okay. So um, let's see. So in terms of the CPA, I'm a CPA as well, so I can ask you this question. How many times did it take for you to take it to pass it? I took, and I'll say I'll say it took me six times. So I want to say you know Phil, I'm, it's been so long ago. I don't know if I can remember. I know four though. And, okay. and here's here's something else. Here's something else. I made you know back when I took it, hundred to pass seventy five on each of four parts. I want you to know that I passed with a three hundred and one. <laughs> so I did not overstudy. That's awesome. Very efficient from the start. <laughs> so what turned you away from the public accounting world because I, I left that myself. I felt like it was watching paint dry for me. Now I got a job as an auditor for the state of Arizona right out of college. So aud government auditing is not a really fun thing to do. And you know, I'm not going to sit here and run down the profession because I know I know I have lots of friends who are accountants who really enjoy it. But it sure. wasn't for me. I, I, I'm, a, I'm a salesman basically. You know, I'm a talker. And uh, as, a, as an accountant for the government, not my thing. Yeah, I hated it. But obviously, that skill set and the knowledge has served you well in terms of uh, producing content from a financial perspective because it gives you a certain authority, right? Yeah. Well, you know what I always wanted to do when I was a kid was learn everything there was to know about money, um, and and that I mean I I got my first rental house when I was 21. My parents gave me a used Toyota when I graduated from college, and I sold that one month after graduating. And used it for a down payment on my first house, which cost nineteen thousand dollars. And I, I, I was all about money, and you know, I collected licenses. You know, that's one of the reasons I became a stockbroker. So I got a, I got a CPA, and then I got a real estate license, and then I got Series Seven, that's a stockbroker's license. I got a commodities license. I got options. I got options principal. I got life insurance, and then I got security supervisory. So I just tried to collect as many licenses as I could, learn everything I possibly could to make myself rich, really, not to become a great writer about <laughs> Okay, so how did you make that transition from stockbroker to someone who can uh, be on TV talking about money? Actually, I was doing, I, I, was, I was a stockbroker working, I was on my local ABC affiliate, this was in Tucson, Arizona, just doing stock market commentary every day. And the crash of 87 is what got me into that. Because the, the market crashed, I worked at EF Hutton at the time, the TV stations wanted to interview somebody, my manager chose me basically at random, and they interviewed me several times, they liked what I, you know, and then they, they came to me and they said, we're starting morning newscast, would you like to be on TV every day? And of course, I'm a stock salesman, and I'm like, hell yes, I want to be on TV every day. So uh -huh. I started doing that, and then three, year, three years down the road, uh, I saw other people doing what I'm doing now, syndicated news in personal finance, and I said, you know, that guy sucks on the air. I think I'm better than him. I bet I could do this job. And so I quit my job as a stockbroker. I was really tired of it. I didn't really like it that much anymore. 
uh, and just went into TV and just started. I used the skill set I developed as a stockbroker, and by that I mean harassing people on the phone. And, and I called up news directors and I said, you know, I made a demo tape and I said, you know, you need to have this on your TV station. And I just badgered them to death until I got enough stations to make a living, which took years. Awesome. So, um, in terms of, um, you know, when did Money Talks News develop? I know that that was a while after that. You said it was only three years ago. Is that right? No, no, no. Well, you mean the website? The website of it, yeah. The website, I always had a website because it was like a collateral piece for television news. So, in other words, an anchor, in, in the beginning when I started doing this, the anchor would say, send a self-addressed stamped envelope to the TV station and we'll send you more information about what Stacy was talking about. Right. So we literally, you know, used Microsoft Publisher, produced a newsletter that covered the, those 13 stories I do every month, sent that out to people in self-addressed stamped envelopes. I mean, it's, it sounds like it was 100 years ago, but anyways, then the, as soon as the Internet came along, I developed a website so that, you know, then they could refer viewers to that website for more information on the stories. Gotcha. I had a website since about 1996, but nobody went there. Despite the fact that a lot of anchors said, for more information, you can go, nobody did. So in December of 2009, I had, I, want to, I don't want to exaggerate, maybe 25,000 unique visitors uh, for the month of December 2009 and made about $300 from Google AdSense. And in, December, in January of 2010, I decided to make that a profit center, to really make the website make money. What what made you want to do that? Because I was losing my ass in television. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really, because what, what what's happening with television is what's happening with newspaper. This is not a slowly eroding business. This is an imploding business. Gotcha. So while I've been doing it for 20 years, there's no way you could do that today. There is no living to be made. I was starting to make uh, $200 a month. I'm doing three stories a week now, okay? $200 a month is what a TV station wants to pay me for all those stories. And not each, <laughs> total. Wow. So, and some of them were just saying, we have no budget for this anymore at all. So what I hoped to do was squeeze this business hard enough, long enough, so that I could retire on it. It wasn't going to happen, though. It was, just, it was just ending. And so wow. I'm still on all these TV stations, but there's just no money. Gotcha. And so, so I had to create a new profit center. Gotcha. So you were producing these videos either off-site or on-site and then syndicating them across uh, several local affiliate news stations. They were running them uh, along, their, along with their business side of their report for the evening news or whatever. And then uh, you were getting paid at first a lot for those segments, right? Yeah, not a lot. But, you know, I mean, you'd tell a TV station, maybe it was $500 to $1,000 a month. And I had 80 of them. You know, I still do. I, you know, so I have stations all over the place. Uh, but then it started shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. Gotcha. Wow, that must have been uh, exciting during that time to, to, cool. be, to be working with that many people at that level. Well, yeah, what's fun, Phil, is, and it still is today, it, it's fun to have a platform. I made more money as a stockbroker in 1990. Then I made, I made good money last year, actually, but the year before, I mean, I made $35,000 in 2008. I mean, you know, this was, this was a tough business. And so money is cool, but what's really cool is selling yourself instead of a stock. <laughs> what's really cool is saying something you think matters to people who want to hear it. And so, you know, that, that's what makes it a really good profession because I can, I can choose the topic I want to represent on television, just like you can on a website, so can I. And I can talk about that topic, and I can be honest about it. You know, being a stockbroker isn't all about saying what's true. Sometimes it's saying what's expedient. And being able to say what's true for a living, I, you can't put a price tag on. Hmm. It's really cool. It's a really great way to make a living. Awesome. So let's, let's talk about the transition to having the blog or... Would you would you would you clarify or call it a, a true blog or what what is the site? You know, I'm, I I will uh, confess something to you. In 2010, I didn't know what a blog was. Okay. I literally did not know what it meant. And so I've got a web guy who's brilliant. I've had him since he was 22. He's like 29 now. Um, 
And he said, you need to do a book? I'm like, okay, what's that? And he said, well, that's where you write down stuff, you know, that you, know, you think is interesting. And I was like, well, it, it sounds like a diary, you know? And he said, yeah, well, that's basically what it is. And I said, well, I don't, I don't know why anyone would want to read a diary from me, you know? So the bottom line is I didn't really understand the whole thing. And the answer to your question, Phil, is I don't want to block. What I want, what I want is very clear. I want to compete with CNN money. I want right. to compete with the New York Times. I want to compete with the Wall Street Journal. I want to be a news source uh, because I understand this business and I want, and I can compete toe to toe. I, that, that's my goal to compete toe to toe with those people to have multiple writers delivering information that people want to read. If a blog is one person's experiences, no, I do not want to have a blog. Right. Okay. Well, talk about the. Uh, for me, those things are starting to come together. I see them coming together in a, in a way. Uh, I have the I a person as a person who started out with just a blog, somewhat of a diary. But I'm a CPA, so I was giving more how-to advice and things like that. But uh, I've seen myself sort of gravitate toward having something more like a news site and seeing myself as starting to be able to compete with someone like you said, a CNN Money or Kiplinger. So. Maybe sort of help talk through. Um, are those things coming together, or are, do you still have to make a choice to go in one one direction or the other, or do you have to be one or the other? You no, know, absolutely not. I mean, you know, I think we spend a lot of time on details that don't matter, and this is a great example. And I've okay. had many of these types of conversations. All this is about is saying something interesting that somebody wants to read. I mean, does your reader give a damn whether you're, you, you call yourself a blog or a news site? They don't care. You're saying something interesting. They want to read it. It's all labels. Nobody gives a damn. So, I, you know, I say do both. Do neither. You know, it doesn't matter. Just say something interesting. Right. Okay. Well, um, I want to continue challenging down this, this conversation. I notice on your site you have Money Talks News, but you also have a picture of yourself up there. Yes. So you're, you're still using some personal branding with your site. And I do the same thing. I have my picture on, on there. And so when people think of my site. They really think of PT Money. They think of me. Um, maybe not so much with your title, but so how, how are you balancing both the personal brand with the, the larger brand of the media organization? I, I think that's a, it's a, that's a really good question, and it's, it's a balancing act. Uh, there's a real specific reason. Well, let me tell you, when I used to market to television stations, I'm competing against Bloomberg, Consumer Reports, um, other, you know, investment services a lot of the time. And so the news director is saying to me, I've already, I don't need you, I've got Bloomberg. And I would say, Bloomberg is a s investment service, first of all, not personal finance, but finance. That's not what I am. But more important, who do you want to take person? Who do you want to take financial advice from? A person or a package? I submit that you want to take person financial advice from a person, and that's what I am. Bloomberg is not a person, uh, so I'm a person with credentials, willing to give advice in language that people can understand. I would say the same argument here. You know, I do I do want to have multiple writers on my site, and I obviously do, but. I, I also believe that having a person with authority and also someone that can connect with the public, I hope I can do that, I try to, adds value to the franchise. So, but it is a delicate balancing act. Yeah. Well, you seem to be uh, balancing it well. So, trying. <laughs> congrats on that. Um, so, maybe, maybe talk to someone like um, me or other bloggers who or maybe looking to, to branch out from just a personal blog to move toward more of a, a, a broader, bigger uh, media or news organization, uh, some of the things that they should be trying to do or uh, not do in terms of trying to move in that direction. Well, you know, one of the reasons that I did this uh, was because obviously what I want is to be the place where my readers go. In order to do that, I have to have content. In order to have in order to have lots of content, I either have to write it myself, which is physically impossible for me to write it that much, even if I were that good or that fast. Um, I have to pay writers, or I have to get uh, other writers to give me content for free. 
And so my first goal was I need more content because I don't want people coming to me and then going to Phil and then going to Widespread and then going to see it in money. If I can, I want them to come to me. So I got to have lots of streams of content. So the first thing I did was I reached out to other bloggers, both from the perspective of using their stuff and also of them using mine, which obviously gives me exposure to their readers. But that gave me more content. Now, when I first started doing this, I was scared to death, obviously, because if I invite Phil to write for me, then they may like might like Phil better. Right. <laughs> yeah. Like inviting you on a date with my girlfriend. Right. <laughs> so I, but I was scared. But then after a while, I, I thought it's okay, you know, because they're, they're still reading me too, and it's okay if they read Phil, and it's even actually okay if they read both me and Phil if they go from my website to Phil's. The main thing is that they can, if they, in their head, subconsciously, they're going to know that they're going to get good content when they come to my site. So I got over that whole concept of it's not okay to have Phil on my site. And I think that was, I think that's really important. Yeah. Then, of course, I started, you know, I paid writers, you know, so I'd have more content. Yeah. And I definitely want to get into uh, your hiring practices and things like that. Uh, but backing up a little bit, let's talk a little bit more about syndication since you've got a lot of experience in that. Obviously, I can't, uh, well, I could. I could produce some, you know, some TV uh, clips or whatever segments and then go pitch those to affiliates. But you're telling me that business is dying. So uh, is syndication still alive in, in the online channels, either through video or through uh, print now? And do you suggest that to other bloggers to look for ways to syndicate themselves? Well, about a third of our income here, our revenue, comes from syndicated video. And so what happened to me was, I told you before, I'm getting squeezed in, in TV. I can't make a living anymore. Everyone's desperate. It's a dying industry, it, and it feels like it's dying. It's horrible. Well, guess what happened? Right in the middle of all this, all of a sudden, everybody on the Internet needs video, and I happen to make it. And it was just it was just coincidental. I mean, remember, I worked for 20 years, almost, maybe 19 years in television news. There's only 600 people that can buy my stuff. That's how many news directors there are in the United States. That's it. They all know me by now. I've hammered them all, you know, for 18 years. <laughs> all of a sudden, I'm calling up Microsoft, and they're, and they're going like, oh, yeah, we want your video. I'm calling up Yahoo. They're going, Where, when can you start? I mean, and it's just amazing, not only because they were taking it, they're paying, you know, bankrate.com. I mean, all of a sudden, I went from 600 potential contacts to infinite. Right. Every website, every bank, every, you know, every news outlet, everybody needs video, and I produce it. And so this revitalized my business, changed everything. And so, I mean, we're on, I, I don't know how many websites run our video, Comcast, thestreet.com. MSN and Yahoo, obviously, Huffington Post, I mean, on and on. And it's, and it's, doesn't, some of it doesn't pay anything, but some of it pays a lot. I mean, what we do three million streams a month on MSN money. And wow. that's significant money, you know, so I would encourage people to do their own video. It's, it's not easy. I'm not saying, you know, neither is learning, neither is being a good writer. Right. But, you know, it, it can be done. So what about writing syndication or text syndication? Same thing. Well, I got started with MSN and Yahoo because I was in there with video. So I went to them after a couple of years, MSN first, and I said, you've got my, I, I want to, basically to be honest with you, what I said was, I want a bigger split of the pre-roll ad revenue. And they said, no. But here's an idea. Why don't you write an article for us? And I said, what does it pay? And they said, nothing. You get three links at the end. And I'm like, oh, great. Thank you. I'm looking for something else to do with my time that pays nothing. <laughs> That's literally what I said. And they said, well, no, but sometimes it might drive traffic to your site. And I'm like, oh, shit. Okay, fine. I'll try it. <laughs> so I did. And that's how I got into writing syndication. And then it worked super, super well. That's how I went from 30,000 visitors a month to I did a million two uniques in October. We're back down to about 700,000 now. Through those referrals? Not just through those referrals, for everything. But, but since you're getting the links now, it's helping your organic search. I, I got 200,000 unique visitors in one day 
to my site from MSN alone. And, wow. And then I'm asking them to sign up for a newsletter. So I went from zero newsletter subscribers to 180,000. Wow. Know? And that's largely through those syndication links. Wow. And so okay. So uh, obviously, getting in, the, having the videos helped you in terms of getting in the door, being syndicated by these. Are you seeing other people being able to be syndicated as well without the videos? And, Absolutely. And, and what are they doing that's that's helping them sort of get in the door? Well, I don't know the answer to that. I, I think that I mean, I definitely push my way in the door. There's no question about it. I think though that. Uh, in, in fact, uh, Karen, the MSN editor, now works with me. And this is MSN Smart Spending, who syndicated my stuff. And um, she goes out and looks at blogs, a lot of them. And so I think she has approached people, you know, the yeah. bloggers. Uh, you've been on Smart Spending, I believe, Phil. Yeah, I had, a, I had a piece syndicated there, and it's my most popular piece ever. And I don't know whether you reached out to MSN or they found you. Yeah, she she grabbed me. So there you go. And I was hesitant at first because I, I by that point I'd learned a little about SEO and I'd learned about duplication of content. Mm. Um, and so that was my fear initially, but then I just let it happen because it was MSN, and then it got pushed to the front page of MSN, and uh, the rest is history. I mean, it's still the most popular post on my site today. That was a good day, wasn't it? Oh, wonderful! <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's fun. And so, you know, I w I don't know. Uh, obviously, I I think it would be wrong to imply that anyone writing anything can call MSN and get an audience and get a spot. But I can tell you one thing: without trying, you won't. Right. <laughs> so that's what I'd be doing, and that's I, and I you know I wasn't I'm not married to anybody at MSN. You know, I'm just a salesman. Right. You know, I, right. I, if I can get anybody else can too. Well, there's probably another conversation about you know presenting your blog or your your site uh, as as sort of a bigger brand uh, versus just some person. There's you know sort of the, those two conversations probably tie in together. Moving toward a, a bigger media company, news company, would help you get syndicated in those type of places eventually, obviously. So, um, so that's syndication. That was good. It was, it was good to hear your your thoughts on that. So what about hiring practices? You've obviously ramped up in terms of having uh, having additional writers and now editors, and obviously you have someone help you do the videos. So maybe just talk to me about how many employees you have, uh, how you've hired them, whether you have them on contract or uh, full-time employees. Well, it, when I started the blog, I mean, basically in television news, I worked at TV stations a lot, so I used their employees. But all we really, all you really care about talking about is a blog, probably. It was, just, it was basically me. Uh, I have, like I told you, I hired a kid out of memory um, who had a film degree, but happens to be a genius on the web, and so I, he was helping me with the back end. He still is now, um, and so I'm writing and he's publishing it, and, <laughs> and that was all there was. Today I have, oh, oh and by the, I also had a part-time video shooter editor. Okay, so. Today I have a full-time shooter editor, a full-time producer, a full-time editor of the uh, print editor for the site, and then I don't know half a dozen writers, I suppose. There, and by the way, everyone I have is freelance. Okay. Everyone's ten ninety nine, uh, and everybody works at home. And uh, we're you know this is my home office that we're I'm sitting in right now, and we share video and print and all this stuff over the internet. You know, because I will shoot video and I'll voice it, and then I'll send my voice over to my editor, who's about 15 miles away from here, and you know, put everything together that way. We get together once a week, you know, the three or four main people, uh, and have which we just did today, have a sandwich, uh, you know, talk talk about some ideas. But by and large, we don't see each other for weeks at a time. Gotcha. And and in terms of you know how you. You know, me personally, I struggle with that, uh, not only for the reasons we mentioned talking about branding, uh, um, and, and sort of moving beyond, you know, the personal blog aspect, but, but I also struggle with that in terms of now I've got someone who's dependent on me to help them with their income. So, uh, you know, traffic can come and go, revenue can come and go from the site, so how do you, 
I guess give your get over the risk of having to hire you know having hired someone knowing that they're now dependent on you. You know, isn't it funny? I it's I've never heard anyone ask that before. Excuse me. Oops. I've never heard anyone had anyone ask me that before, but I've definitely felt that, that way. Yeah. It, and you know what? It's funny because I think about people like Bill Gates. <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm sitting here because I actually do worry about that. I'm like, what if I step in front of a bus? I've got four people who are actually depending on me to make a living. And I thought, think, what is it like for the, for Bill Gates? I sure. Mean, what is it like when you have a hundred thousand people depending on you? And it's just, it's amazing. But you're right, there is a responsibility. And I think one of the things, Bill, is that I I've never I'm bootstrapped totally. I I don't I never borrowed a dime. Uh, and I am very conservative, which all of everyone watching there or listening to this probably is too. We're financial bloggers, you know. We're obviously not out uh, spending our way to the moon. So I'm just, you know, I've always I've always spent less than I made. I don't make commitments I can't keep. I pay people immediately, you know, whether they're writing one article or they're my video producer. I pay people every single week that I'm supposed to. I pay them one day after they turn in an invoice, and I keep the money to do it, you know. So. Does that allay every single fear? Hell no. I mean, you know, my traffic can go down. And I just told you, I've been as high as 1.2 million, and that was months ago, and now I'm doing 700,000 unique visitors. That's a big drop. And I, in a business, I expect it to go like this, you know, never have a drop. So it's, yeah, I mean, you get a, you get a little scared. Uh, but, you know, I, I don't, like I said, I've got plenty of money in the bank. I'm prepared. And I, you gotcha. know, I, I try to make it as, as low risk as I can. Gotcha. And you, you, you've hired along the way uh, different pieces. And obviously, you can dial that back in different pieces if you needed to. Um, fingers crossed that you don't, right? Um, so any other tips in terms of hiring uh, writers or what you, maybe what you look for in people to work with you? I'll tell you, when it comes to writers have been the most challenging thing to me by far. Writers and editors, too. I understand video really well because I've been doing it for a really long time. I don't know a thing about writing. I have an accounting degree. Now I've written a book or two, but I don't. I've never written an article in my life until January of 2010. Uh, and so I was so relieved to know that actually I could actually hire people that knew how to write. And the and they were cheap. You can buy you can get a writer for fifty dollars for an article or you know a hundred for a good article. And so I was astounded that people would do this. But you know what I found out? They suck. <laughs> a lot of <laughs> I, would, I mean, to this day, I am astounded that there are people who will hang out a shingle calling themselves a professional writer, and they can't write their way out of a wet paper bag. <laughs> it's amazing. Obviously, I don't think that's true of all of them. I don't think it's true of my writers that I have now. But it was much more difficult than I thought it would be because I assumed anybody who called themselves a professional writer could certainly outright me because I don't think I'm that good of a writer. I'm okay. But these guys were just horrible. And a lot of the reason why, too, is that – I was just saying this to someone yesterday, Phil. It's not that I'm smart. It's that I'm old. You, I mean, you turn in a, an article to me about buying a house when you're 23 years old, right. and you haven't bought a house. You don't. I can tell from the writing that you have it because I can just tell by the terms you use, the expressions you use. You know what I'm saying? Experience yep. comes through, and there aren't very many 57-year-old writers about write, You know, about buying a house that are working for 100 bucks or 50 bucks a story. So. Yeah. Experience matters, and, and it's not that easy to find with inexperienced writers. So it's not just that they don't know how to string a sentence together, which is true of some of them, but they also just don't have the life experience that it takes. I bought, I don't know, 10 houses. I don't know how. I can't literally count the number of cars I bought. Uh, I mean, I've done this, you know. It's, like I said, it's not because I'm smart. I've just done it. <laughs> so right. I, know, I know what the pitfalls are. I didn't read them in Kiplinger. I've experienced them, and that, and that shows in writing. So, you know, the first piece of advice I would give is try the best you can to find people who are not just experienced at writing, but experienced at both life and life as it applies to personal finance. Yeah, yeah. Do you, uh, with your connections in traditional media, have you been able to find people that way? And, uh, you know, would you recommend hiring 
a journalist versus a writer, someone who's looking to maybe make news versus do how-tos or uh, I don't know, I don't know, some other type of feature piece. But you know, how, how do you how do you balance? I, I, do you go after? Well, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna hire one guy that's my journalist. He's gonna find news. I'm gonna hire one person that's gonna write my how-tos. Sort of how do you just structure in your mind the people you go after? I guess. Well, sometimes I've tried both these things. I, I think that a good writer can basically tackle any personal finance topic. However, that being said, if you have an interest, like for example, I've met several people who are interested in travel because they travel, and they like to write about traveling. Great. So if you have an interest, absolutely. Uh, but I think you know most people, at least people who are going to be successful as personal finance writers, are interested in all aspects of this business, uh, or all, all aspects of personal finance, I should say. So you know, I, I think you can find well-rounded writers. Now that being said, sometimes I I need an insurance writer, you know, because I, I I don't want to write it myself, and I find that you know the 23-year-olds can't do it. You know, they don't know it well enough because it's you know you get into more vernacular and things of that sort. So what I'll do is I'll go out to I'll go out to blogs. I'll just literally look for people who are writing in other places. Often you can find them, you know, by doing a Google search once you know their name, and then just send them an email and then find out if they're affordable or not. You know, I've done that too. Okay, I like it. Now, uh, this is probably a good time to segue into the the different segments on your site. I mean, your site is called Money Talks News, so you obviously have a news channel versus things that are more feature-based articles versus things that are deals uh, versus reviews. So in your mind, sort of how do you segment your, your site? I, I really was just trying to think about what people want to know. Um, so, and, and I can't honestly sit here and, and tell you what my categories are. I think we have 13 of them. But, you know, there's cars, there's college, there's spending, you know, there's credit cards, there's, um, co I said college already. Uh, I can, I, you know, I can't remember, but you know, the, the different types of categories, real estate is obviously one of them too. So the different kinds of categories of, of spending that you might look at or, or personal finance that you might look at, debt. Okay. And I don't know if you have a specific deals section though, someone sort of manning that, kind of keeping that up to date. Yeah, we do. I do have one person and I've had her since the very beginning. She's okay. actually an excellent writer, can write on almost any topic. Uh, but she's interested in this, you know, and so she goes and looks at the coupons and stuff, something I'm really not interested in. Uh, and, and really, to be, to be honest with you, we felt like at the beginning it might be an affiliate uh, opportunity, a revenue opportunity. I haven't really made any money on it, but it's real popular. I think it's kind of like the, I think it's like the sports, uh, the sports uh, segment of a newscast. Uh, there are some people, 80% of the audience doesn't care about it at all. But the twenty percent that does won't watch your news if you don't have it, and so I think you know you got to you got to have deals, and so that's right. that's why we have. It. I like it. I've tried coupons and deals in the past, but it was something I was trying to do myself. And uh, you're right; it's it's time. It's something that's timely, and it needs to be sort of updated regularly, and just something I, I couldn't handle at the time. But uh, I, I like what you're doing there. Oh, good. Thank you. Um, another thing that I see is. I think they're called the either the money minute or the um, oh yeah we just money in a minute money in a minute right yeah this sort is of something I started relatively recently well, not that recently maybe a year or so ago I've got one guy uh, and he does he was doing five stories a day now he does three so I have my I have two feature stories a day one guest post um, and then and then I have this guy who's doing three stories every day. And all he's doing, I'm sending him headlines. I get up, you know, whatever, 6 o'clock in the morning, see what's going on in the world, send him headlines that I think are interesting. He turns those into, I think, like 150 words. Um, and he, he, he says the source where he got it, but he basically restates it. So, um, and so now we've, I've got more, more stories coming out every day without a lot more effort. I think gotcha. Hundred bucks okay. Into three stories. Now, Let's sort of tie those two together, uh, the, the uh, previous two questions together. So you've got the money in a minute segments, which are the 150 to 300 word pieces, and then you've got the deal pieces, which are sort of recurring, updated uh, yeah, often. Yeah, three days a week, right. So you're creating a lot of small, uh, small content, a heavy volume of smaller content. So. 
Uh, with Google's Panda algorithm updates, I'm always worried about producing something that's uh, sort of small and, and very timely. In, in other words, in a week from now, it won't be a piece that's worth a lot. And then over the course of a year and a half, I'll have a high volume of content on my site that is of that nature. So I want to avoid that. Um, and so I'm, I'm making a conscious effort to try to avoid that type of content. So I'm wondering if you do anything strategically with that type of content on your site, if you, maybe you're no indexing it at some point or how you're treating that content well, long term. If, if I'm taking a guest post from you, Phil, I'm no indexing that, obviously. <laughs> Uh, no, really. I mean, you, know, oh, you mean a, you mean a syndicated piece for me? Yeah, yeah. If I'm taking a piece you've already ran, gotcha. You've already run on your site. I'm no indexing that, for, of course. Uh, but I don't. I would not no index anything else. If, if it's original work, we're using it. And I have to tell you something too. I'm not an I'm not an expert at the internet. I, what I think about is what my audience wants to read. I don't want to be penalized by Google. Don't get me wrong. I'm not an idiot, but if I can put out five stories instead of two, and if those stories are interesting to my reader, I really don't give a damn what Google thinks. Okay. I'm honest with you. What it's more important to me what my reader thinks. And like I said, I may be wrong, but I, I, I'm really about trying to make the reader happy because they're going to ultimately make me happy. And if Google doesn't like that, oh well. Right. Because I mean, in the great scheme of things, man. If, if you and I and, and you and me both do a story about the seven way, best ways to buy a house and CNN Money and MSN and Yahoo did it too, no one's going to see you and me on Google anyway. <laughs> They're going to see them first. So do I want to do SEO? Obviously I do. Do I, do I want to be penalized by Google? Obviously I don't. But I've got 180,000 newsletter subscribers who are reading my stuff every day, and I want them to be happy. And that's what I'm yep. going to write to. Okay. Uh, so two follow-up questions to that. Uh, how do you take your content and then get it to your email subscribers? We send out, a news, uh, we send out an email every day, uh, and it's got a little picture and a headline next to every story that we're putting out that day. Okay. So it's, it's, it's a mirror image almost of the current publication for the day. I don't know if it's a mirror image, but yeah, it has the same stories. Gotcha. And uh, man, that's a, that's a lot because so that's driving a lot of traffic. Is it? Is it? It's obviously snippets then, so they then come to the site if they see something interesting. It's, it's the headline and the excerpt. Yeah. And by the way, we bonus our writers. I, was, I, I mentioned earlier how we don't pay our writers very much, but our writers also get paid based on how many people click on their story in the newsletter. So that incents the writer to do a good headline and a good excerpt, and obviously also it gives them more money. And I can tell them and be telling the truth: as my business grows, your income grows so, because we get more newsletter subscribers. Right. So now everybody's happy. That's awesome. Um, well, that's good perspective, and I, thanks for sharing all that. So. I see you have 20,000 Facebook followers. How, you know, how, what's your secret to get into that level? All we really did was, oh, I know what we did. When you scroll down our page, I don't know if it still does as we speak or not, um, we give away a Money Talks t-shirt every week. Uh, and the Money Talks t-shirt is pretty funny. People like it. So okay. oh, you, you, you like us on Facebook and you might win a Money Talks t-shirt. That's how we gotcha. do it. That's all, it's all we've done, I believe. Okay. And um, in terms of engagement on Facebook, are, are you pleased with what you're doing there? Or? Not at all. Not at all. No. Uh, we're, we're working on that right now. Um, my web guy, Dan is his name, uh, just went to a developer Google developer conference and talked to a lot of other website guys. And, and our engagement is really low compared to other sites. And we're working on that. I, I actually have started personally responding to every comment we get. Not every comment, but you know, a lot of the comments we're getting on Facebook, trying to engage more with the audience. It's very difficult. I don't know how it is for you, but it's very difficult for me to keep all these balls in the air. Um, uh, you know, for me to, like, engage on Twitter and Facebook and produce video and write articles and sell the site, you know. Yeah. I'm always dropping one of them. You know, some ball is going to drop. And uh, it, I've just tried recently to pick that one up again because I think it's really, really important. Yeah. 
Well, it's a good start having 20K followers. So that'll that'll cure a lot of uh, what ails you there. Um, so I had a follow-up question about content. Oh, you said you mentioned you, you know you want to write what your readers want to see. So what are some ways you, you sort of stay in tune with that? Well, we actually ask readers sometimes what they want to see. We also, by the way, here's, here's something that Dan just uh, instituted, my web guy, recently. You can actually just hit reply to the email that you get every day from us uh, and ask a question. And so that's really helped a lot. Because I, I, I do, a, a, actually, every Tuesday, ask Stacy. So you can ask me a question. And I answer it, you know. Uh, and at the end of that, it would say, do you have a question for Money Talks or for Stacy? You know, blah, blah, blah. Well, the other day, well, maybe three weeks ago, Dan started putting at the end of our newsletter. It's now 180,000 people every day at the end of the newsletter. It says, do you have a question? Hit reply. You don't have to go to the site or anything. Just hit reply. And now, questions every day. Awesome. It's, and, and obviously, also, we take a really good look, Phil, at what people are reading. I mean, I, I'm bonusing my writers based on their you know, number of clicks on a story. So, and, and also, I've been doing for three years, what is MSN putting on their front page? You know? Right. So, you know, we're, we're trying to pay attention to what people want. So we're listening to them personally, and also we're watching what they're doing, what they're clicking on. Have you ever played with the volume uh, email subscription? Uh, that you're sending out, of emails that you're sending out, you're sending out one a day. I would say that's a lot. Uh, I, I don't know if I could get away with that with my audience, but you seem to be doing it, and maybe you have some feedback in regards to that. We were nervous about doing it. We started off, uh, I, I think, maybe one a week, and then we went to three a week. And I remember uh, Dan, because there was only two of us back then, and I remember him saying, you know, maybe it's too many. Maybe people will drop us. And I said, well, you know, there's one way to find out. Let's just do it. And we have had, we have unsubscribed. But you know what happens when people unsubscribe? The website automatically says, are we sending you too much email? If you want to go just once a week, click here. And so we save subscribers that way. Oh, that's awesome. What email program are you using? Gosh, I'd have to ask Dan, dude. I have no idea. Okay. That's slick. I know we're, I know we're serving through Amazon, but I don't know what email program. So you've got so you've got two emails then you've got a daily one and a weekly one that's an alternative. Right. We have one on Sunday and then we have one daily. That's awesome. Okay. That's a good that's a good tip. Um so do you have people from traditional media coming at you saying, Man, how do you how you how have you been able to do this? You seem to be owning all your own content, you're monetizing it well. Um, you know, do you have those folks coming at you saying, How how are you doing this? or some I have. Uh yeah, well you know it's this isn't rocket science. This is pretty easy stuff. Uh, I, I, you know what I'm always amazed at is the number of people who are losing money at this. Because there and there are big companies, and I, and I think that's why, <laughs> that have never made money at all. I, mean, I, I don't know. I'm not going to name names, but I could because I don't know if it's true. But I've heard from people who probably know that there are major names, you know, on television, that you know, I mean, advertising on TV, major websites that have not in one quarter ever made money. Mm. They, well, they've got an acre uh, office in New York in a skyscraper, you know? Right. Uh, I guess that's why. I, I don't know. And, of course, you know, the, the medium that I'm traditionally competing with now, television news, for example, or newspapers. Well, their buildings are big, and they're full of people, and they have expensive equipment, you know? I mean, right. when I started in TV news, it cost $250,000 worth of equipment just to make a news story. And now, you know, the camera I use today is $8,000 camera. But the camera I used 50, 10 years ago was 60000 And the editing system I used was 50000 And now it's, you know, the laptop you're looking at right now. You know, it's just nothing. So my overhead is very low. Their overhead is huge. Uh, and keeping a low overhead is not that difficult to do. Well, I think you're. Uh, I think you're a pioneer. I mean, along with along with several bloggers who are sort of moving in the other direction. Um, you know, hopefully my myself included one day. You know, I I sort of see us sort of owning this space in the middle where we're producing the content, we're owning the content ourselves. It's a very low overhead, like you say, 
and uh, we're producing a real high quality product. And at the end of the day, you know, we're helping people with their finances and yeah. we're doing it in uh, our own way. And you know, it's uh, it's fun too. So yeah, I worry about us being able to. I mean, because you know, you've seen the the um, landscape consolidate. You know, the the and people with tons of money will end up owning the internet. You know, kind of a thing. And and I, I worry about that. You know, Yahoo decides not to take any more external content, or MSN does, and and then you and I are out left out here floundering and competing against people who are not just more better capitalized, but they could crush us with a little finger. You know, right? And you know, I I, I, I want that's that's why I think it's really important, by the way, for people like you and me, ostensibly competitors, but for all of us to get to be together in some capacity friendly competitors, but exchanging ideas, because if all of us are together, then we can compete on any, on any playing field with anybody. Yep. And I think that's critical to yep. the survival of that middle market you're, descri you're describing. Yeah. So um, i throw you a curveball here. Why do you have a Wikipedia, or how, how did you get a Wikipedia page? That's from TV News. OK. And I, I assume, I don't know where it came from. Actually, I didn't create it. So I don't know where it came from. I noticed there's a criticism on there of your quote zealous support for a specific perspective and a tendency to report only on that perspective. Do you know what that's about? I don't. I don't. Well, of course, I have no way of knowing you put that there. But I'm not surprised. I mean, you know, the truth is, you know, I, I find it funny. I, I'm not going to discuss politics, but I, I think it's interesting that so many people say, well, the media's left wing, or what, you know, whatever, however they describe it. Well, you know, the truth is that I'm a consumer advocate. That puts me on the side of Democrats more often than not because Republicans are usually supported big business. But, and again, I, I'm not really not trying to make a political statement. All I'm really sure. trying to say is when you defend the little guy against the big guy, you can't help but develop a point, a point of view. I mean, I, I, was, I was a stockbroker, okay? I was a major Republican in Ronald Reagan days. But you can't work as a consumer reporter for 20 years and walk around saying that AT&T is a great company or, you know, drug companies and, I mean, I, insurance companies. I mean, these people get, they step on people right. a lot. And, I, and this is what I've done for a living. I do it every day. I've talked to people who have been crushed by corporate America. And... You can tell from the way I'm talking right now. Do I have an attitude? <laughs> Hell yes, I have an attitude, and I and I'm happy about it. You know, I'm not saying that I'm biased, but I'm telling you that I'm happy that I can give a voice to people who otherwise wouldn't have one. And I have seen many, many injustices done to people who didn't deserve it by people with more money than they had. Yes. So that is an attitude. So there it is, and it's <laughs> okay. I like it. I just saw that on there, and I thought it was interesting. Um, so let's talk. Uh, let's back it up a little bit, and before we close it out, I want to talk about how you're monetizing the site now. So you've talked about, you've hinted at some different things, but you know, what's what's your big uh, money maker on the site now? Well, Google AdSense, no question, by far. So uh, uh, the lion's share of our income comes from Google AdSense. We also do get pre-roll ad revenue, uh, primarily from MSN. Basically, everywhere else doesn't matter uh, in comparison. So when you say pre-roll, you mean before your video starts, you display an ad? Yes. I don't. They do. And okay. so basically, in exchange for playing my video on their site, they uh, give me a percentage of the ad revenue that they get. Nice. And so does Yahoo. Again, you know, some, a lot of sites do. But, some, I mean, you have to have lots of traffic volume before it matters, you know. Um, and then we also have affiliate relations, which are, you know, like credit cards and insurance quotes and stuff like that. Not, not a big revenue source for us, though. Um, and then TV, I have some revenue from. Gotcha. You know, relatively inconsequential, but some. Very cool. Okay, well, um, anything I forgot to ask or anything you wanted to add? How I can be so smart and be so good looking at the same time. <laughs> oh, yeah, what's, what, tell me about that award. <laughs> Tell me about that award I see over your shoulder. I'm looking at an Emmy yeah, or, a I did a, or I did a video. I did a video uh, on how to interview, how to do video interviews. 
so I did a TV news story on how to do video interviews. And I said, one of the things I said was, uh, look, you know, pay attention to your appearance, which obviously I haven't done today. But I also said, look at your background. See those Emmys over my shoulder? They're not there by accident. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> yeah, I won I like a couple it. of Emmys years ago. Okay, very cool. Nice. Well, it's a pleasure having you on uh, the podcast, and uh, you're a rock star, man. And I love learning about your business model and how you're doing things. And like I said, I know a lot of us bloggers want to be moving in that direction. So thank you for being on and sharing your story. And it uh, sounds like we're going to uh, see you at FinCon as well, potentially in a speaking role. I know you've submitted something. So we'll be reviewing those in the next couple of weeks, and, and hopefully we'll get you on the stage there at FinCon. Well, on the stage or off the stage, you'll definitely see me at FinCon. And by the way, Phil, you yourself are a rock star. <laughs> you came up with a creative, unique idea, and, and it's one that benefits the entire community. You, you came up with that yourself. You developed it yourself. You're executing it super well. So kudos to you, my friend. Well, thanks. Thanks. I appreciate that, Stacy. All right, my man. Well, have a great day, and it was good having you on. You too, buddy. I'll see you soon. All right. Bye.